I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors. Trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is The James Altucher Show. Describe the relationship between quantum computing and AI, because I think quantum computing is a concept nobody understands, including me. <laughs> well, well, quantum computing basically changes the roots of uh, computing as we know it so that it's not based on a physical bit that's either one or zero, but that it can be essentially dynamic so that uh, it uses the actual physical properties of the materials that's used to build the quantum computing that allows for uncertainty and also um, rapidly searching the space of uncertainty. So as applied to AI, rather than uh, searching a arbitrary uh, you know, tree, possible acts, let's say you're building a uh, game player uh, on, on the possible actions, uh, action A or versus B, a quantum computer can hold all the options um, as possible and simultaneously pursue them and essentially turn what's called an uh, MP complete problems into um, uh, polynomial time so that... Um, Rapid optimization becomes possible, and that could change the way that future AI algorithms uh, are built. Yeah, so so the problem with a game-playing computer is that it searches this huge tree of, of trillions of nodes, but a quantum computer could, like you say, solve an NP-complete problem. It could solve you know, a one with a thousand digits after it, number of, of nodes, rather than building a tree. It could just look at all of this instantly. And that's going to change the nature of cryptography, uh, cryptocurrency, AI, plus perhaps our own ability to decide what AI is good for us or not. Maybe the AI starts making decisions about what's good for us. Like in the case of education, you could say, no, I'm not teaching this kid anymore. It's too much. Yeah. 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 So there are many things that quantum computers can do. It's almost like computer science being rebuilt from the ground up. So we don't really know what applications will be revolutionary. So in the story, I described the one application a lot of people talked about, which is uh, basically breaking in to um, uh, Bitcoin wallets, which is uh, well known to be doable as a way to trigger the other activities in the story. But you're, you're very right. Um, that is a possibility where, you know, if, if singularity were possible, if um, unimaginable brilliant super intelligence were possible, that's something that could be triggered from uh, quantum computing. Uh, that's that's a uh, highly, we don't know whether that's the case or not. 
and it's likely to be more than 20 years away. Uh, so in the in the story that projects kind of 20 year vision, I didn't project it that far for super intelligence or singularity to happen. Uh, but that's certainly the, the if singularity and super intelligence were somewhere were to happen, most likely would come from uh, quantum uh, technologies. But how far away, like a lot of these stories I feel are almost doable right now with the right mm -hmm. push. Quantum yeah. computing, we're still in the early stages of. Where do you where, where do you see that in the time frame? Yeah, I, I'm also not an expert in quantum technology, so I researched a lot of experts' views. Um, I think the experts' view generally point towards uh, 10 to 20 years to build uh, something like uh, 4,000 uh, logical qubit uh, quantum computer that uh, is stable enough to to be run, and on that computer breaking Bitcoin wallets is one application, or, or, or I think if you put it more positively, revolutionizing cryptography would be one of the first applications. And then there could be many more. So it's, it's at least not within 10 years and probably not over 20 years as a starting point. And 4,000 qubits is just like, you know, when, when you and I learned programming, you know, it was a very slow uh, computer. And, and that could grow by you know, millions of times over the next uh, century. You know, a lot of people think that, you, you know, they, they, you, you talk about the singularity and people ask the question, are computers going to become quote unquote intelligent? Why is that an important question? Because I feel like we don't expect animals to become intelligent like humans. You mm -hmm. know, why isn't it enough simply that, let's just take the example in the first story, the AI insurance is better at it than a human in, in that specialized environment. Yeah, I think it's, um, it's a human uh, habit being the supreme animal that inhabits Earth, that we compare everything to us. You can think of it as a narcissistic uh, tendency. Yeah. That's why, you know, in every alien movie or in every, you know, super smart animal movie or every robot movie, it always somehow gains the, 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 the toughest human uh, innate capability, which is our sentience, our self-awareness and, and um, our desires and emotion. But, but I think that currently, at least uh, in the next 20 years, is, is not the most important question because uh, the AI that will develop in the next 20 years is not similar to the human brain. It will do many, many things and many more things, much, much better than humans and cause new problems that we need to be aware of. Um, and among those problems, being like human and having our desire and greed and fear and um, it's, it's not one of them because these are, after all, just algorithms that become super smart and that cause issues like externalities that are in the book. And the, the AI does not become human-like. So if you look at sort of the space of all possible things that AI can do, it will grow and grow. And uh, there is another circle that's human capabilities. And, and more and more of the human capabilities will be better done by AI. That's a scary thing. I think the challenge upon us as mankind is whether we can grow that human circle in some other dimension, whether it is uh, creativity or passion or our, our individuality or um, our emotions and love. And, 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 and those are uh, possible room for us to grow in ways that we are uniquely good in ways that AI is not so good. Well, what do you think that humans are uniquely good at that a very specialized AI would not be good at? Because well, you, you mentioned creativity yeah. in the book, and there yeah. are many examples now of computers composing things that may be indistinguishable from a Mozart piece. Right. And, and we have to ever modify these uh, descriptions of creativity, right? Used to be computers could not do anything creative. Now, I think we would say that, um, yes, a, uh, AI can emulate uh, Mozart or Picasso, but it cannot create a new Mozart or new Picasso, a new style of art, a new st style of expression, uh, uh, in, to, and done in a way that's expressive, um, uh, appeals to our emotion, and gets us um, excited. And AI cannot create yet 
a new you know AI algorithm, uh, the next deep learning. So so I think we're we're basically at a stage when uh, when emulated creativity uh, is now better done by AI. AI can make you know your family photo a Picasso style or a Monet style better than uh, artists, better, faster, and cheaper than artists. But they cannot create a new style. So so I think we're elevating creativity to a new a new level. And similarly, you know, AI cannot do the complex thinking of a CEO or an M&A expert. Uh, and similarly, AI cannot create feelings of connectivity, trust, and um, human-to-human -human connection. So, Th so that I argue I, with. That that I dispute. Yeah. Because that, I can I can feed in your conversations for the next five years into yeah. an AI. And then yeah. when I want to talk to my virtual friend, Kai-Fu Lee, <laughs> uh, I might not be able to tell between the real Kai-Fu Lee and the one that's listened to your conversations for five years and has, yeah. and has also trapped, tra tracked your brain patterns and, and then, you know, figured out which conversations to label as good, which ones to label as not so good. And it could create a very good ver version of you that I might not be able to detect for a long time. Uh, yeah, I, I do think um, that is possible, but I would, um, as devil's advocate, give you a couple of reasons why that's farther away. Uh, one is that uh, such an algorithm um, needs only one mistake to lose all the trust because human mistakes are predictable. So if I say something a little bit silly, but sort of human-like, you would accept it. Right. If I said quantum commute, computing can be done, I think in five years. Now you might say, "Hey, that's a stupid thing to say," but okay, that's human-like. If I suddenly say, "You know, quantum computing is like McDonald's, very yummy," you say, "Wow, how <laughs> stupid is that?" But but when you look at GPT three, sometimes it does something really stupid. So I think our ability to uh, remain uh, trustful, trust trusting that an entity is human-like requires not making horrible mistakes using our human common sense. That I think uh, you, you need to get to a very high degree of confidence, right? 99.999%, which is ever difficult to get. So that's issue number one. The second issue is uh, as a chatbot, uh, possibly that level of Turing test, even in an hour could trick you in 10 years. That Well, that is Kai-Fu even in 10 years, um, but uh, but if you want to create a real human connection, right? People still say that uh, we cannot create a true connection in a uh, chat room and, and maybe not even over Zoom. And, and that face-to-face -face, um, um, in-person contact is needed. And the ability to create an in-person robot that you can't tell is me that passes that low of level of Turing test, I would also argue is, is more than 20 years. So those are the two reasons. How would you measure that? How would you how would you measure success in, in a task like that? Well, I think we could have a um, <clears throat> Turing test that is more challenging than today to to make um, to really uh, find a picky person, picky smart person like you, <laughs> who could in an hour talk to a someone you really know, like um, Kai Fu, and in an hour you couldn't tell whether it's me or not. That could be kind of Turing test 2.0. Turing test 3.0 could be that done, but in a face-to-face -face context. And I would argue phase one would be at least 10 years, maybe longer. Phase two would probably be uh, more than 30 years because there are many parts of robotics, motor skills, et cetera, that are yet difficult to emulate. But then you I know, come back, uh, but, but then I come back and, and question again, you know, we're falling in the trap of using AI to emulate humans again. Right, that capability that you just described would be more commercially viable. I mean, if I were a startup, I would not be building a Kaifu emulator. I would be building a uh, targeted advertising engine. Right, you kind of hinted at that earlier. That watches everything that that you look at and then figures out how I would sell a Tesla to you, how I would sell the next iPhone to you, how I would sell the next um, Netflix subscription to you, based on the last five years of conversation that you've had, a targeted advertising engine is commercially much more viable and valuable. And if that made a mistake, it's no big deal. It's not like a Turing test, but also that creates a lot of scary things because now you've got a super smart Cambridge Analytica engine that is uh, trying to wash our brains and convince us to buy things with ever more 
powerful capabilities compared to Google AdWords. Oh my gosh, I love these clothes. Mizzen and Maine, that's M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Maine. It really is the most comfortable work clothes. Travel clothes, I'm tra- I am had to travel this whole week. I'm traveling for a week and a half and I just took Mizzen and Maine clothes with me. Close out 2023 in style with comfortable, breathable, packable, and machine washable pieces from Mizzen and Maine. As you wrap up your year-end goals, enjoy a Mizzen and Main dress shirt that you can wear confidently. I like that they've got very, very just nice, solid colors. I don't really like to get all fancy in patterns and everything, although they do have some pattern shirts, but very comfortable clothes, stretchable pants. It's just super comfortable, but they look professional and they, you can wear them casually or professionally. I like some of their flannel shirts or untuck shirts. I love untuck. I never tuck in. So again, uh, whether you're shopping for a special someone or giving yourself the gift you really want, I just buy myself gifts. Mizzen and Maine is the perfect gift for any guy who works, travels, and or cares about looking and feeling great. As you could tell by my many photos across the internet, I care about looking fantastic. I'm practically a model. And let's be honest, Every guy loves to look great. So again, shop now at mizzenandmain.com and save 20% when you spend $130 or more using promo code James. That's promo code James at mizzenandmain, M-I-Z-Z-E-N and main.com. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So, I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match. Up to a hundred dollars. That's the easiest hundred dollars you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But people in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're they're sponsoring uh, this episode. 
If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking, Dan Brown on writing, or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one -on -one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov. You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Memberships start at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one -on -one classes with all 180 plus Masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180 plus Masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So this holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. There's all these things that change based on small changes in your behavior. So there's ads, you of course mentioned insurance. There's things like credit score, which is a form of insurance. Uh, you know, there's, there's various, you know, there's of course the whole minority report type scenario where how dangerous is someone before they become dangerous. And, you know, a lot of this stuff is not, you know, rocket science in the sense that I remember in, I think it was 1988, a young man by the name of Kai Fu Lee did, created the world champion Othello program using technology very similar to what's used in this insurance program. You basically had a, a every position was defined as a vector of features and some vectors led to winning games, some vectors led to losing games and you would then statistically match a brand new vector, a new Othello position, and determine what's the odds that this is a winning position or a losing position. This is the deep learning you describe in many of these chapters. And this was, you did it in 1988. Uh, yeah, except it was with shallow learning, I guess. It was a one-shot Bayesian learning. But yes, uh, you're probably one of the 10 people who still remember my work on that. Thank you. What What, what is the difference between that and... I mean, in in deep learning, I guess part of it is the 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 system is learning the the features that are important for these vectors. Well, yeah, so you can put an arbitrary number of features in in deep learning. You can train it with uh, incredible depth that makes the um, uh, discrimination function much more complex. Uh, you can target it on each individual based on to essentially to individualize. So um in in in, you know, in, despite all my desire to get some credit, uh, I really think deep learning is, uh, you know, a million times more powerful than the papers I wrote in the eighties. And so, so, so what's, what's next, which, uh, uh, which, which of these are you actually looking at as an investor now? Like what areas are you exploring in AI? Well, I, I believe natural language is the next breakthrough. And I, I think you share that belief and, and the, the rational um, justification for that is back in about 2014 was when AI algorithms beat people in computer vision tasks, namely that of object recognition. And essentially last year was the year where um, 
AI beat human capability in natural language task, namely reading comprehension. And um, and I think once um, AI beats human, that in a in in a pretty hard, uh, although domain specific tasks, that means it can be applied to all kinds of applications. So that's why after 2014. Um, AI has been applied to all kind. Computer vision has been applied to all kinds of tasks, like uh, you know, automated stores, autonomous driving, uh, image recognition, um, smart, um, and also deep fake and and face recognition, and many many things that are built from uh, the vision algorithm. So now I think the natural language algorithms, uh, people use GPT three as the um, top example, but I would actually more generalize, say it's based on the Google Transformer idea of, of learning uh, context. Essentially, the new natural language breakthrough is in order to understand language, we have to look back at not the last three words or 30 words, but you know a million words that we have spoken and intelligently use AI to associate the most relevant concepts selectively based on the last you know, million words that we've spoken in order to predict what we might say or what we might do. And that fundamental capability, I think, can power the next generation uh, advertising engine, the next generation uh, engine in, in, in machine translation, in question answering, in super smart search, where we ask a question and get one answer. Uh, to, to, to validate that, I'll, I'll, be, uh, I'll give a free ad to Google now. One of my most amazed technology that, that shocked me was over the last few years, Google search now has a uncanny ability to answer questions. So most people don't try it because we're used to entering a sequence of text and looking at web pages. But try asking Google a question. It is uh, you know, infinitely better than it was three or four years ago, precisely because of this technology. It's not perfect, it makes some mistakes, but it's amazing how it can pinpoint one answer. So sort of fulfilling Larry Page's vision. I remember when I joined Google, uh, Larry was famous for saying the right search engine is not entering a bunch of text and get a bunch of web pages. It's answering one question and getting just one answer out. And now I would say probably in 70, 80% of the time, uh, Google can do that for me. And, and of course, you know, this will continue to advance. And I think that is the basis on which we will see a lot of progress based on the ability to understand language. And after all, our language, you know, English, Chinese, what, what have you, is the basis on which our intelligence is judged, is the unit in which we think of thoughts, is the way in which we communicate with people. So that, I think, ought to have a much bigger impact than uh, computer vision even. Hmm. And, you know, it, it's interesting because I think when AI first tackles a problem, it uses this very brute force, you know, it understands basic knowledge of the domain and then uses brute force to determine what are good decisions and bad decisions. But then as AI has become, you know, deeper learning, it almost it uses deeper learning. It almost out humans the human. So with com computer vision is a good example where brute force was good enough for it to identify an apple versus not an apple. But really now, you you know, with deep learning applied, you could see, you know, apples, very obscure images in, in, in complicated photos. Or you could even start saying, oh, this apple looks like it tastes good. Like it actually can start to figure out what other properties of the apple other than just that it's an apple. Uh, yes. And it can make, you know, an animated apple that uh, makes you smile. It can start to do things like that. So uh, I think the ability to synthesize, to create things, um, um, I think is another direction. So, so I think, you know, today people get hooked to TikTok or Snapchat because uh, these are videos created by people, considered by AI to, to be attractive to us individually. But I think a future will be where these videos are created from nothing and constructed using understanding of our beliefs and likes with language, but synthesized with its understanding of images and video. So, so, these, um, so these content and video will be targeting specifically for you. But yeah, here's, here's where it might get insidious though. 
is that like TikTok's a great example where it uses AI and the algorithm to determine what videos you might like. And so what ends up happening is it's almost like a, a you, you reach a local hill and not the maximum hill you could reach because it's once it realizes that you're satisfied, it starts showing you these videos. But that that could the danger is leading us down these echo chambers of just people while I'm looking at videos just for for, for people like me and. Mm -hmm maybe the, the AI hasn't really reached this next level where something that I didn't know would be good for me, it will start showing me. And, and yeah. yeah, 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 absolutely. That's why in the story um, I talked about the, um, the limitations of AI is really that we train it on simple tasks, like uh, the number of minutes we uh, walk, stay on TikTok or the amount of money we buy from Amazon, rather than things that are good for us. So, so if there is a way in the future of measuring whether we've grown uh, as individuals, we've become smarter, we've become more thoughtful, we've become happier, wiser, as a result of watching the series of videos that are being shown to us, once that algorithm can come out, then we've, we'll, we will have aligned our interests with the company's interests. And arguably that's, Good for the company too. Would you would you argue though that technology is there, but now we start to get into the privacy issue? So, for instance, if something was constantly monitoring the dopamine, cortisol, and serotonin levels of my brain, it would know. Oh, we've we've just shown images that raise the adrenaline a little too much. We now okay now we're going to show images. Here, here's images that increase serotonin, dopamine, cortisol, adrenaline. So you can, if, if I were to give up all my brain and genetic data to AI for a year, probably amazing things can be done with current algorithms. But, yeah. but then you start to get into this issue, like how much am I really willing to give up to software? Right. Um, we are already giving up approximations of that, right? Because your serotonin levels are approximated by your clicks and your, your, your activity on a, a, an app. So we're beginning to give that up. So I think the big, the big the two questions are, uh, can companies use that for good versus for profit? Um, and that's the question I was raising on whether it can measure our long-term improvements rather than our short-term instant gratification. The other question is, well, how do we protect that privacy data? Uh, there are technologies being proposed, such as federated learning and others, that says, okay, I will... Uh, keep your data on a on your home server or um, in your hospital if it's medical data or on your cell phone even and never let it leave but please let me learn from it so we can aggregate and make smarter models so so that it doesn't know about you individually but yet at the same time we have our cake and eat it too and use your data to improve the overall model there are algorithms being devised for that and that might be a way to uh at least partially solve the problem or, or reduce the concerns. So it's very interesting because I, I so I just there were, remember earlier I said there's three components of of this concept called well-being defined by the study of positive psychology. And one's community, one's mastery. The third that I finally remember is freedom. And mm -hmm. at what point, on on in terms of good intentions, this should free us. So instead of me searching the phone book about what the best car mechanic is, I could just ask Google, get me the best car mechanic. And in fact, send someone over to pick up my car and take it there and fix it and, and done. So that gives me freedom of time, and, and which, is a, which is a luxury that used to be very expensive. Now it's getting cheaper and cheaper. Time and solitude and, and so on. But at some point, it's 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 like you say, and you you have this balance throughout the book. I would argue the book is almost about this: this balance of when are we free because of the AI, or when are we a slave to the AI? Because you know, from the first story to the last, we have to take into account how these what are the AI's real intentions? Are they commercial? Mm -hmm. Are they good? Were they trained on the sophisticated training set? W were, were the creators of the AI interested in training on an interesting set. And so yeah. it's going to be an interesting back and forth, I think, to figure that out. Uh, yes. And that's, the, I think that's a great summary of the book. And it's really a call to action for AI scientists and engineers to really 
understand the potential dangers of AI uh, are not AI gaining self-consciousness, but rather uh, either people with bad intentions programming AI in the wrong way, or people not being um, uh, familiar with the nuances that could have externalities and impact. And once I think the AI scientists are aware these are issues, there should and will be more energy and, and time being put into developing solutions that protect our privacy, like federated learning and developing um, uh, products and solutions and detectors that will tell the AI scientists, hey, look, you think you're benefiting the user, but actually uh, these are the long-term potential dangers. Have you considered using these other ways to, um, uh, to, to reduce the danger? So it's just like when we learned programming, you know, we were told, you know, don't use go-to statements and uh, use the compiler when it gives you a warning. Uh, heed the warning because it could you could you know, overflow your memory. So 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 these are sort of the AI compiler that we now need to build to to ensure that the engineers are aware of the potential dangers and hopefully get better and better at at fixing it. Well, Kai Fuli, author of or co-author of AI twenty forty one, and also the earlier book AI Superpowers. You were on the podcast for that. Uh, such a great idea to write 10 beautiful science fiction short stories about near future potential of AI, the dangers, the stories, the characters, the characters were really brought to life. Your, your co-author was, was excellent. Do you think any of these will be option for movies? I could see movies out of many of these. Uh, yes, we are beginning to talk to uh, Hollywood. Look at you going all full circle, <laughs> all the way from, <laughs> Carnegie Mellon technology to Apple, Microsoft, Google, China, and now back to Hollywood to make your first movies, probably powered right. by AI directors and actors. A lot of actors are worried that eventually they're going to be replaced and people say, oh, no, that will never happen. But it's, it's going to happen eventually. Yes, it will replace the um, average um, actor who doesn't have any exciting deep skills. So we come back to the same problem again. How do you become a you know brilliant actor without first learning to enter the space? You know, well, which leads to an interesting question, which is you know there's this cognitive bias, Dunning Kruger bias. Everybody tends to think, for instance, they're a better driver than they are. Everyone tends to think they're smarter than they are. What if AI now really tells you, no, these are the talented people. You're actually kind of mediocre. <laughs> That's <laughs> going to be very frightening to a lot of people. Oh, that, that will lead to an uh, instant uh, dystopia. We better, better not do that. I think we better keep letting people think um, they are, uh, if they keep working hard, uh, they will become better in some area in which they'll actually get better. That would be the best outcome because I believe everyone's good at something. But um, in order to get to that state, uh, AI may have to mislead and, and sugarcoat and tell white lies to, co to basically coax people along so that they can get to that state. Um, people yeah, do again, not want to When will AI proactive. reach the point that it goes beyond the basic, this is good, this is bad, and sort of takes a meta view that we have to coax goodness out of something? I think, I still think the humans will have to do that for the next 20 years. And yeah, that's I, a hard one. Yeah, that, that is a hard one. That's why I wrote the stories. So it's for people who are thoughtful and excited, hey, this is uh, programming the new AI to improve the huge future of uh, humanity. That's a great aspiration for hopefully a read, one or two readers of this book. Well, again, it was a very inspiring book. Uh, uh, really beautiful. I encourage people to, to buy this as soon as it comes out. Thanks once again, Kaifu, for coming on the, the podcast. And when one of these becomes a movie, I hope you come on again and tell us about that process as well. Absolutely. Thanks for inviting me. Powered by Snapdragon, the Samsung Galaxy S23 Ultra elevates your photography to epic new heights. 
Snapdragon processors deliver a color experience like no other with sharp, industry-leading 8K video capture. You can also snap images in 200 megapixels, capturing more detail than ever. And those late-night blurry pics are a thing of the past thanks to next-level night mode. Experience powerfully moving premium photography only with Snapdragon. Follow us on Instagram at Snapdragon Official.